greetings of the day welcome to chapter 6 of principles of insurance book ic01 see basically this chapter is devoted for the insurance contract now for insurance contract there are fundamental it is governed by fundamental principles what are the fundamental principle that you should have a insurable interest for taking insurance then which is the next that means you cannot take insurance for somebody else property you can take insurance of your own house you can take insurance of your own ship if you are chartered the vessel you can take the insurance of your uh, the chartered vessel but you cannot take life insurance of your neighbor you cannot take so because you do not have any insurable interest in the process so there is a principle of insurable interest which is the basis of which is which decide the who can take the insurance and for whom you will also know the principle of indemnity ensures that insurance can be used only to shield one from potential loss and not to make profit the second principle that you cannot make profit out of the loss if there is a loss i can jack up the claim i can show it is you know there was a story which uh, earlier also i have shown that shivji is going and then the woodcutter is losing his ex and then he gets the uh, gold and silver and then end of the his own ex uh, the other one he is telling no gold is mine but he doesn't get anything story is simple everybody is aware of it so then there is a principle of subrogation because it is a marine policy so every marine the transit the transportation of cargo from one place to other it is governed by the contract of carriage be it a road carriage or ocean carriage or air carriage or courier or road transport or rail rail so whenever the loss is attributable to their negligence the insurance company would pay the claim and then try to pursue recovery from them under letter of subrogation so that is another another very important person and then the, the it will also ensure that person cannot claim from different sources the principle of contribution that is ensuring the claimant does not benefit from the multiple you take 2 3 4 5 insurance no you can't get the uh, the uh, you can't make profit out of it so there is a principle of contribution so there are various principle which are governed by the contract and you should be aware of all these things that these are the various contract so what all things are there so we are going to discuss the insurance contract then we are going to learn about the significant of the principle of insurable interest now this is very very important because everywhere when you are in the insurance industry you will be discussing about this then you understand the principle of indemnity the the then the principle of subrogation and contribution and then there is you have to understand the uh, <coughs> uh, the principle of subrogation and contribution of course and then you learn about the importance of the principle of utmost good faith yes the insurance is governed uh, by the principle of utmost good faith and you understand the relevance of the proximate cause what is the nature because the insurance policies can be all this policy which is governed by the exclusions or it could be a named peril policy named peril policy means what is covered is listed out so there are fire policy earthquake policy uh, the, 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 these are all named peril policy and you should know about named peril policy so these are the uh, introduction about the chapter 6 about the insurance contract and then one by one we will discuss about the various principles see the insurance contract is always in between the insurance company and the person who is coming up with the proposal for the uh, this particular contract so there is a proposal then there is a insurance contract and it is with the insurance company so the insurance company agrees to pay the policy holder a certain sum of money that is a sum insured or sum assured in the event of death or a peril that is fire earthquake etc or loss of ship loss of cargo specified in the insurance contract if that happens provided the policy holder has been paying the premium 
as specified in the insurance contract, then the, the claim will be lodged with the insurance company and then he will be indemnified. So indemnified means his loss will be made good. In the full process, it is not expected that the insured will make profit out of the loss. So what are the terms of an insurance policy? The insurance policy would specify various things. First thing, the risk which is subject matter of the contract. You see, the risk insured should be a subject matter of the contract. It, you cannot go haywire. Whatever you want to insure in should be spelled out very clearly that this is the thing what we are covering it. If it is a motor vehicle, then with registration number, all details ownership has to be provided. The event on which the liability of the insurer would arise. So it is a partial loss, total loss, third party liability or liabilities. So you have to tell that which event you are trying to cover under the policy. Then the nature of liability of the insurer, the amount and the manner of the payment. You see, the, 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 the nature of liability of the insurer and amount. So what is this sum insured and under which contract, under which uh, the, the terms of contract, the insurance policy has been issued. Amount, the amount and the manner of payment of premium by the policyholder. Naturally, from premium will be decided and either it will be paid by cash to the insurance company or it will be a NEF transfer or it will be a check payment or there could be annual policy. So you are paying once only. There is a sales turnover policy. So you are paying the every say after quarter, three months, four months, considering your turnover. So it depends, you know, for automobile policy, 99% you don't get any concession for payment of, you know, premium on the uh, basis of uh, install installments. But there are various policies they do give if it is an annual policy, there is a provision of installment. Then other obligations of any policy holder, there would be a lot of uh, conditions to be imposed. There will be a lot of do's and don't do's in the policy. So there will be a lot of obligations will be provided uh, from the policy holder. It will be incorporated in the policy. And then the consequences of default of obligation. So if there is a breaches, if there is a, there, the, the obligations are in a way, it is a condition imposed or it is a warranty imposed. If there is a breach, what is going to be consequences? It will be forming part of the contract which insurer and insurer, insurance company is uh, engaging with the proposer or with the insured, what, what we call it. So the foremost principle is insurable interest. You should have, if you want to take insurance, you must have insurable interest. Otherwise, you cannot take insurance. You cannot take the insurance policy if you do not have insurable interest. Uh, the insurable interest, what is that? It exists when the insured person is able to obtain financial benefit or any other kind of benefit from the continued existence of the object of interest. Insurable interest in any way, atom or individual is set to arise when the loss of the atom or the individual would result in causing the person to go through financial hardships or any other kind of loss. So insurable interest occurs due to the ownership, possession or through direct relationship with the object, uh, object of course individual. It can be understood from the example that any individual will happen to have insurable interest in his own home or family and not on some random home or random family. I was giving a lecture in National Insurance Academy and then I asked one uh, participant, you know, a direct, uh, the direct recruit officers for one of the public sector unit insurance company. So I was asking him that, yes, uh, uh, there are all future CMD, future general managers and future very senior personalities of insurance industry. So I asked him that, sir, uh, can you define the insurable interest? So one gentleman, one future general manager of insurance company, future, future, you see, I'm just, I'm trying to, you know, uh, tell you in the lighter moment what I'm trying to say. Don't take it seriously. The gentleman told me that if you have a 
interest in the in the prop in the property or in the atom or the certain things you know if you have interest then it is an insurable interest i said how can you say like this that if you have an interest the interest is an insurable interest no you may have an interest in your neighbors uh, your daughter but that that doesn't mean that it is a it is a bloody uh, insurable interest the insurable interest to have insurable interest you have to go to that atom's father and you tell that atom's father that sir your daughter is very beautiful i want to marry with her the moment you marry then the insurable interest is attached so try to understand the you should have insurable interest when you are taking a policy with from the insurance company otherwise you cannot take somebody's properties insurance you know it's, it's you cannot be you cannot say that if this truck is going it meets with an accident and i will insure on that so if it meets with an accident uh, i will get the money no it cannot be done that so what are the legal basics to decide whether insurance can be taken or not so what we have to understand first is circumstances related to insurable interest how insurable interest is that try to understand this is the foremost principle and everywhere you know if there is no insurable interest you cannot put up a uh, you cannot have a, a claim from the insurance company say so for example in marine policy the marine policy may be taken by a sailor but then once the titles of goods are passed on to the buyer and then when the when the insurable interest is attached with the buyer then if there is a damage during his possession then only he can put up a claim so till that time the insurable interest is not transferred and if the loss is earlier to transferring of the goods then he cannot put up a claim so there, this is very important everywhere be it a cargo cargo policy uh, in hull and machinery policy you should have a insurable interest in cargo at the time of loss in hull and machinery throughout fire policy throughout so this is very very important so in common law what are the thing you should have self your spouse then the parents and assets so this is this is your you can take your insurance your spouse insurance your children's insurance because you have insurable interest your parents insurance and then your assets your vehicle your bungalow your car uh, your your all properties you know whatever it is so all these properties you can take insurance so under contract also you can take certain insurance so what is that the employer can take the uh, policy for employee because employees also you know that personal accident or sort of thing they are on the duty <coughs> so there is a the employer's interest in the uh, employee then there is a company key man the the ceo the the expert person in the industry so if he is ill if he is uh, having accident he is hospitalized naturally the company would suffer so he is a key man's insurance can be taken the partners they are important to the company they can take the insurance and then the uh, surety debtor the debtors surety can be you know that can be insured. creditors and debtors can be insured back bank mortgage so whenever things are is for example i am taking a loan from the bank the bank will ask for some surety as if it is the item is lost then who is going to pay to the bank so the whatever insurance i am taking on a property till that time loan is on the, the i am taking a policy and which is hypothecated it is mortgage to bankers so bank can also have and the owner tenant also can have the uh, as per the contract there is a relation and when there is the relation there could be a so for example the tenant tenant can also take because he is responsible for the safe keeping of the, the the thing what is having a say a house or something so he can take you know uh, the uh, the insurance because he is a he is a custodian of that particular property he the billy can take it the custodian of the property can take it and then as per statute your cars your cars must have the third party liability why because this is as per statute then executors and trustees they can take the insurance uh, this thing the bailers you know the bailey bailers so they are the as per statute they are uh, required to keep 
the bellman or the, the as a bailee, uh, self custody of the goods held in trust, and these people can take the uh, insurance for that particular property. So it is a legal matter. The insurable interest it is a vast subject to understand, and you should this is this being the first principle. You should be have thorough knowledge about the insurable interest. So try to understand the legal basics to decide whether insurance can be taken or not. So insurable interest has to be proved at various stages. There are three different stages. In some of the cases, at the time of taking the policy, like life insurance, because at the time of your life insurance, either you are taking that it is for 25 years, and if you survive for 25 years, you get the money back. Or there are certain policies; it is only uh, it will mature only after death. So, in some cases, the insurance policy, or you should have insurable interest when you are taking your own policy. Like a life insurance, whereas in some of the cases, like fire policy, you should have insurable interest at the time of taking policy. Also, you should have insurable interest at the time of loss uh, or claim uh, in fire policy. Uh, in marine policy, at the time of loss, you should have insurable interest because the seller will take the policy. It is transferred to buyer because the transit is covered. So till that time, the Titles of the goods are not changed to buyer, the, and then the buyer cannot claim. So, whenever the cargo is in the possession of buyer, and if the damage takes place, then he can claim the claim from the insurance company. So, he should have insurable interest at the time of loss. So, these are the legal aspects of indemnity. If I have lost a Four steel X, I should get four steel X only. As a, I should be indemnified with that only. I should not claim for gold and X or something. So this is the principle of indemnity, which is ensuring that insurance contract protects protects you from the. In order to compensate you for the damages, loss or injury. According to the principle of in indemnity, insurance should place you, the insured, at the same financial position before uh, what you were before the loss. The purpose of an insurance contract is to take you whole in the event of the loss, not to allow you to make a profit. Thus, the amount you compensate for the loss is directly related to the amount of loss that you actually suffered. You should not make profit out of the law. Insurance is not for making profit. Although it is a if in fraudulent uh, organizations, fraudulent companies, they have a ledger in their books of account, profit from insurance. That is wrong. It is That means they are making a profit out of losses. That is not the principle. It is not a good faith. It is not a business of, it is, it, there is a breach of good faith. So, how indemnity works? So, the individual has taken insurance, the individual suffers a loss, the individual makes a claim, an insurance company indemnified the individual considering the amount of loss as per the terms and condition of the policy. So, there will be under insurance, if there is under insurance, there will be deduction for under insurance. Of course, there are certain deductibles and excess provided. So, say up to 0.5%, you will be suffering your own losses. You will be self insurance for that. So, this is the principle of indemnity. The idea is whatever is your loss, you should get it from an insurance company and you should never try to make a profit out of the uh, loss. So, let us see indemnity in life insurance. They will be enforceable in the case of life insurance policies. The principle of indemnity is not applying. The indemnity principle means that the policy payout should restore the insured to the same financial position in which he has before the loss has taken place. Since the value of human life cannot be ascertained, the principle of indemnity does not apply 
as it is not possible to quantify the loss. So life insurance policies are fixed benefit policies. You decide value, how much policy you want to take. So when a claim is triggered, the defined sum assured gets paid out of irrespective of other existing policies of the insured. So that means if insured life for life insurance, you can take 10 policies. One is 10,000, other is 20,000, 50. You pay premium and in case of death, the beneficiary will get the as per the policies. So there is no question of, you know, any contribution or something like that. You can take n number of, you decide what is value of your life. So in thus in case of life insurance, if you have multiple plans, all of them would pay a claim in the, uh, independently to the nominees listed in each policy in case of death, full ins sub insurance is paid. So indemnity is your, indemnity, your, your loss is made good. But in case of life, the insurance company cannot give a life of that person. And then also cannot quantify the, the, the amount that what is the value of his life. Value of life, you have to decide how much I want to take insurance. And at the time of, either you get that sum with bonus at the time of maturity, or in case of death, the beneficiary will get the benefit of uh, uh, the insurance. Now there is another insurance which is agreed value insurance which is the policy for which you and the insurer agree on the value of a covered atom. The, the atom is guaranteed to be insured for that fixed amount in the event of claim. Say for example cargo the cargo policy is said to be agreed value policy. So the, 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 the value will be, of course there should not be fraudulent intention in valuation of the cargo. If there is a fraudulent intention, unnecessarily you are trying to make more over valuation with intention to get a claim, then it is considered as a fraud. So since the agreed insurance covers the full value of the property, it is commonly used to insure expensive and modified vehicles, art, paintings, absolute machineries and agreed value policies. See, many times what happens, I have a, uh, a, a painting which is of Hussein, which is drawn by Hussein. Now naturally, the value will be, it is very difficult because the, uh, the only curator can decide what is going to be the value. So there are, there are methods of valuation of these old atoms also. And then the value, uh, that value can be insured if it is given a proper certificate from say any, any museum is, museum curator is telling that value is so much. And why value, and why value is so much? The agreed value policy is also on the cargo. Uh, uh, the cargo is agreed value policy. But they will give the basis of valuation. It should be, for example, cost insurance freight, cost insurance freight per 10% or, or the duty can be insured. Whereas ships or the motor vehicles, they are not on the reinstatement value. They are on the market value. And then, uh, uh, for example, uh, fire policy, it is on reinstatement value. So I want to make this property again now. Land cannot be insured because land doesn't depreciate and with the fire, earthquake, flood, the land will not be destroyed. So you can take plinth foundation above structure and then you decide how much is going to be reinstatement. Every year this will change. So you can keep on increasing. So the valuation for the indemnification, the principle and then the methods and the, uh, the rules and regulations are not same for life are not safe for cargo, are not safe for the ship, it is not safe for the fire policy, machinery breakdown policy, etc. So you have to firstly understand what is agreed value policy and what is the uh, what is the indemnity. So try to understand what are the methods of indemnification. Either there is a cash uh, payment or there is a reinstatement, you know, means the insurance company will reinstate the things or they will repair the things. 
or it may be replaced with. You see, it is seldom done. The insurance company, 99% or you can say 100%, they go for the cash payment. The payment to the insured and you do whatever it is. But then, technically, yes, they can reinstate the goods. They can repair the goods, uh, the damage item, and they can replace it. You know, they can purchase it and give it to you as per your specification. So, in non-life general insurance, the manager in which the principle of indemnity is applied depends on the following. Class of insurance, subject matter such as property, liability and definitely the type of policy. So, these are things which is affecting the indemnification. Now, what are the factors that affect the indemnity? So, the deduction for under insurance or the condition of average, if the insured insurer insures his property for lesser than the actual value, it is unfair to the other contributors of premium to pay him the full loss. Hence, a proportionate deduction for under insurance is made, which is known as the condition of average. For example, if the one Mr. Curran, if he is insuring his property, which is having value of 5 lakh rupees, but he is, he is taking a conscious decision and is insuring it for 3 lakhs only. Now, for example, there is a loss of 50,000 rupees. Then he cannot get the full 50,000 rupees, but three-fifths of the 50,000 rupees would be compensated. So, this is the under insurance. So, if you are not taking insurance of your property uh, uh, adequately, as per the market value or as per the reinstatement value, whatever is the requirement of the policy and if uh, it is it is proved at the time of loss that the market value or reinstatement value is different than what is insured, the under insurance will be deducted. So that is, this is the, this is one thing which will affect the indemnity. Then the deductible and excess are provided in the policy. So in general insurance does not cover losses that are certain and not fortuitous, not accidental. Now, to ensure this ordinary and certain losses are not reimbursed as an excess or deductible, it is applied to the time of underwriting, which is the, which is, see, what happens that there are the, the, there may be in rupee value or in percentage value, they will say, say, the first 10,000 rupees lost will be borne by the insured. So, that is a deductible excess. So, when I am assessing a loss and if it is 1 lakh rupee and if the deductible is provided minimum 10,000 rupees, then the 10,000 will be deducted as a DA for excess and what will be paid is the 90,000 rupees. The deductible excess could be in terms of uh, percentage also, percentage of some insured or percentage of that particular the value of that particular and it depends you know so we have to go through the policy and what is the intention of underwriters when they are providing the deductible excess third is what so minimum amount recoverable in general insurance policy the maximum amount recoverable under the general is the sum insured or actual loss whichever is higher so your sum insured is 1 lakh rupee and your loss is say for example 2 lakh rupees obviously your under insured but this being a total loss, you will get the 1 lakh rupee. But if you are insured for 1 lakh rupee, the, the, the market value or the uh, is also 1 lakh rupee and the loss is 50,000 rupees, then you can claim only 50,000 rupees. So, whatever is the loss uh, and whatever is the sum insured, these two criteria are checked at the time of settlement of claim. Now, you should know the principle of subrogation and how the principle of subrogation works. Once the insurance company compensates the insured for the financial loss, the rights of the insured person get transferred to the insurance company. The process of transfer of rights from the uh, insurance company uh, is known as subrogation. Now, there is every possibility that the losses is because of repairs negligence. There is every possibility that losses are because of the person who has taken on higher, he has he was negligent. There is every possibility the in transit, the road carriers are negligent. So, as per the contract, as per the roads act, the, uh, the various acts, the transporters and the 
person who is who is defaulter he is responsible for the losses but then the claimant he will take from the insurance company and what are all the rights of subrogation he will hand it he will give it to insurance company so insurance company can pursue recovery from that third party so subrogation will ensure that they having paid the claim to the insurance company gets the rights to make goods the damages from the party who has caused the loss so they will go to transporter to the say for example repairer now my repairer is negligent and because of that there is say for example the my equipment is getting damaged i can always sue a repairer under the contract if there is a contract if there is no contract then forget it but then in the in that case the insurance company may settle the claim if the repairer's negligence is covered under the policy and they will pursue recovery under letter of subrogation similar thing it is with the charterers the person who has chartered the vehicle vessel or something and if is negligent and if is not a owner definitely you can pursue recovery from them under the letter of subrogation what is second thing having been indemnified by the insurer the insurer does not retain the right to get compensated by the party who caused the loss and thus make profit from the insurer yeah this is also another thing that you cannot make profit out of loss what happens that i take from insurance company and i also go to the transporter under different contract and i try to take amount from him also that that means he is making a profit out of loss so he cannot sue transporter he cannot sue third party because he has already paid by insurance company for the loss uh, if there is a difference in valuation etc that will be dealt separately legally but otherwise it is only insurance company who can pursue recovery under with the letter of subrogation now the principle of subrogation ensures that the insurance company does not suffer due to negligence mistake or irresponsible behavior of some third party the subrogation thus reduces the insurance losses also also justice demands that through the insurance company settles the claim the third party responsible for the accident is not absolved uh, of his or her financial responsibility subrogation ensures also that the insured does not get compensated more than once so this is the this is how uh, subrogation works now what is the principle that insurer cannot make profit out of the loss this is not gambling that there is a the, you you are gambling it and you are making profit out of it no this is only to get you indemnified put you back to the, your same financial position so insurance company is entitled to recover money from the third party but only to the extent he has paid as compensation to the insured person the insurance company cannot recover more than what he has paid as compensation so subrogation makes sure that the insurance company as well as the insured does not profit in the above example of insurance company cannot recover from say for example uh, a person a kishore more than what he has paid to amitwa as claim of rupees 10000 uh, the principle of contribution the principle of contribution ensures that if there is more than one insurance policy drawn up on uh, the subject matter the insured cannot recover their losses from all the insurers in which case they will recover more than their loss or even make a profit in life insurance it is different but otherwise in the property my property is valued in 1 lakh rupee i cannot take 10 policies because i mean 10 policies that means my intention is to put an arson on them maybe my malafide intention to make profit out of loss it is a fraudulent intention it is a it is a breach of utmost good faith so for example there was one vessel that vessel was hit by a royal canadian vessel ship the royal canadian ship has hit one ship a merchant ship and then there was a loss the insurance company has paid 1.5 million dollar uh, as a, a compensation towards the loss because that was being some insured now they were having a counter case against the royal canadian navy because their vessel was uh, the degree of blame was with them so they were pursuing a recovery through court and then the court award considering exchange rate considering the interest everything it has come down to 2 million dollar for example 
now insurance company is getting two million dollar. They cannot make profit because wow, how much they have paid? They have paid only one point five million dollar to the vessel owner. So remaining fifty point five million dollar, considering the expense of expenses of litigation etc., they will have to reimburse back to uh, the insurer. Of course, there would be certain expenses of litigation, and that will be uh, considered in this full process. So you cannot make the principal is. You should not make profit out of loss. The principle of utmost good faith. Now, this is the doctrine. Utmost good faith works. The doctrine of utmost good faith requires all parties to reveal any information that could feasibly influence, feasibly influence their decision to enter into contract. If I am not telling certain thing, so that this cargo evaporates. This cargo ignites. This cargo can have spontaneous combustion. This atom uh, ca can have a liquefaction. This are, so there are various inherent nature. It 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 can if it comes in moisture, it will start exothermic reaction. So th there are certain hazardous chemical, certain chemicals which can explode. So now these are the thing. If I don't inform insurance company at the time of taking insurance, and then if they accept the risk. And which is not known to them, with a different premium, different thing. Naturally, at the time of settlement of claim, they will say the loss is attributed to exothermic reaction, which is in their nature, which you never disclose to us. So whenever you are going to the insurance company, something like that, you go to doctor and tell him everything correctly. Fact, the fact related to the particular atom. It is not that nobody is asking you your. Date of birth, etc. But the facts related the behavior, the inherent nature uh, of that particular atom, the particular uh, thing which are going for the insurance. So there are the agent must reveal the critical details about the contract and contractual terms. There are even contractual terms uh, are sometimes in such a way that it, it needs disclosure to the insurance company. So applicants meanwhile are legally obliged to present. All material facts, as they are known, including precise details on whatever needs to be insured, and if they have been refused insurance coverage in this in the past, the information is used by insurers to decide whether to insure the applicant uh, application and how much to charge the premium. So, at the time of their calculation of premium, at the time of acceptance of premium. At the time of acceptance of risk, if you misguide them, if you will not reveal the actually true information about the uh, the atom which you are going for insurance, naturally at the time of loss, the insurance company may ask many questions in the process. So, what is the doctrine of utmost good faith? The doctrine of utmost good faith, it is also known as in Latin uberaime fidei. It is a minimum standard legally obliging all parties entering a contract to act honestly and not mislead the withhold critical information from the other. It applies to many to many everyday financial transaction and is one of the most fundamental doctrine in the insurance law. So there is a disclosure material disclosure of material fact. And the principle of utmost good faith. These two things are very important because at the time of taking, at the time of passing on the risk to the insurance company, you should not give a wrong information or a guarded information by which they will be influenced in different way for taking the uh, taking the insurance, accepting the risk. So how the the principle of utmost good faith may be breached. What is that non-disclosure? Non-disclosure of the material fact. It is a breach of principle of utmost good faith. And then what is that misrepresentation? So what is that misrepresentation? I am going a wrong information about the risk which I am trying to pass on to the insurance company. If it is a fragile atom, I am not disclosing. The inherent properties of the particular atom, I am not disclosing. Maybe it is already in damaged condition, I am not disclosing. 
maybe it is the atom is not there so it is a misrepresentation and this is all fraudulent intention then it is not covered under the policy so try to understand what are how many principles what we have checked about the insurance and which is very very important at most good faith insurable interest indemnity subrogation mitigation and then proximate cause which is also known as a causa proxima nearest cause so these are the basic things which every person should understand when you are entering into a field of insurance so try to understand the duty of disclosure in life insurance in life insurance the duty of disclosure ends with the completion of the contract so what all the proposal form is asking about your age weight bp blood sugar what all information they are taking having taken that whether you drink you don't drink once you take do that your duty of disclosure is complete now duty of disclosure in non life insurance general insurance in non life insurance the contract will stipulate whether ch changes are to be intimated or not the duty of disclosure on insurance company the insurance company should declare all the relevant information and benefits of the product to the customer because there is always a complaint that there is a policy is worded in a small print nobody reads etc but then it is a duty of insurance company it is a duty of broker to explain what is the pros and cons of this particular policy what is covered what is not covered what is always policy what is named peril policy in named peril policy what all the perils are covered and what all the perils not covered this is to be informed to the insured so now we have come to proximate cause what is pro pro proximate cause of loss the proximate cause is defined as the active and efficient cause that sets in motion a chain of events which brings about a result without the intervention of any force started and working actively from the new and independent source the dominant effective or operative cause of the event is known as the proximate cause if there is a chain of events leading to the cause it should be examined whether the first cause was insured peril and whether the ultimate cause has resulted from the uninterrupted chain of events without an independently intervening cause interfering in between so for example the earthquake so if the earthquake is excluded from scope of peril with the earthquake if it start the fire what is going to be a the, the, the immediate cause is the fire but the proximate cause of the loss is because of earthquake the kerosene lamp fell down and then it has uh, there was a fire in the property or something like that so you have to understand what is the uh, the immediate cause and what is the proximate cause of loss this is very very important because whenever there are named peril policy the any person will try to see for example if the earthquake is not covered automatically tsunami losses will not be covered so this is the this is the doctrine and you have to understand what is proximate cause whether it is covered or it is not covered under the policy in named peril policy so at the time of assessment at the time of settlement at the time of recommendation they will see that what is the peril covered if the fire peril is covered then the loss has to be with the fire only so is something like that thank you very much in this particular chapter we have seen what is insurable interest then we have seen what is the contribution we have seen what is the proximate cause we have seen what is the uh, subrogation and various principles of the insurance uh, we have discussed indemnity the principle of indemnity we have seen so this these six principles are very very important at any level at any stage definitely people will be asking you questions on this principle so you first mug it out or whatever you understand this principle thoroughly uh, 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 when you are int entering into a insurance field so all these contents of video are only for general information or use they do not constitute advice and should not be relied upon in making or refraining from making any decision 
in case of any omission or discrepancy information in original records will be final and binding it is also not guaranteed that information in this video is up to date and ultimate i have prepared this presentation for educational purpose to best of my knowledge and ability thank you very much and all the best to all participants